This is a song, a song of the sea. Here on the sun, the world is just for me. Splashing and spraying and singing along. This is a home, the sea and its song. Hi boys and girls, it's lovely to be back with you again. And you know, I forgot to tell you something in our last meeting is that puffins are also known as clowns of the sea or sea parrots because they have that orange bill, yeah? And they have red feet. So they're known also as the clowns of the sea. So before the environmental video, we are going to just have a little reminder of the warm up and the song that we learned in the music workshop, okay? So I'll go through the warm up once on my own and then I'd like you to come in the second time round. So I'll do this and uh, let's give it a go, shall we? Mm -hmm. Up like a puffin flying high in the sky, down from the cliff edge, oh me, oh my. Dive, swim, dive, swim, fish, back home, fly, fly, fly. Gonna join in? Up like a puffin flying high in the sky, down from the cliff edge, oh me, oh my. Dive, swim, dive, swim, fish, back home, fly, fly, fly. So now we're going to go through the song again and I'll sing it through once by myself and the second time I'd like you to join me, okay? Yeah? Very good. All right, we ready? Up, 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 down, 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 Marley is my name. Off to get some yummy food for us to eat at home. You ready? Up, 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 up down, 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 Marley is my name. Off to get some yummy food for us to eat at home. Lovely, so enjoy the video and I'll see you at the story. Hello boys and girls, and welcome back again to our beautiful beach for the final time here in St. Andrews. Today, we're gonna to be learning a little bit more about Marley, our Scottish puffin over here, and all the beautiful friends that she gets to live with in the sea and on the cliff edges. So Marley is a puffin, and puffins, they spend most of their time out at sea, flying around, diving in, swimming and fishing, and when they need to rest, they just sit on the water and bob along. But when it comes to nesting time, they come back to the shore and they go to their cliff edges and they start to nest. Now, when puffins nest, they dig a burrow or sometimes, and I think Ashling told you this, they actually live in rabbit burrows that are left empty. And so they dig, 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 get to the bottom of their burrow and then they build their nest at the bottom of it. And that is where they lay their egg. Now puffins, they nest in colonies, and a colony is a massive group of different animals all living together. So with puffins, you can have colonies up to four million puffins all together in the same place. And that colony you can find in Iceland. We have slightly smaller colonies here in Scotland, but we still have them scattered across the west and east coast of Scotland, and then all across the UK as well. Now when these eggs that the puffins lay hatch, they hatch into tiny little balls of gray feathery fur. And they're called pufflings. Isn't that a cute little name for a little animal? These are our puffins and they're gray chicks. They are called pufflings. Now puffins aren't the only birds that live in colonies. You have the flightless penguins that waddle across the ice and you have the big, big albatross that like to nest on the top of cliffs. And all of these birds live in colonies so they can stay protected. They stay in large groups so that the predators can stay away and they can defend themselves from it better but they also stay in large groups because there's small areas that are actually better to live on, where there are less predators for them to defend themselves against. Puffins aren't the only birds that like to live in colonies. You've also got the penguins that like to waddle across the ice and you've got the big, big albatross that live together at the top of cliff edges. And these birds like to live in colonies so they can stay safer away from being attacked by predators. Now you have bird colonies scattered all across the world, but here in Scotland, we have lots of bird colonies too. And one of them, if you just look over that hill, 
you might sometimes be able to spot the Isle of May. And here you can find lots of different birds living together, and one of those birds are puffins. Now alongside these puffins, you've got lots of different birds. You have arctic terns, and arctic skewers, and guillemots. But actually you have my favourite birds as well, which are gannets. And I love the gannets when they fold their wings in and dive into the sea to catch their fish. Now, that's the end of my little bit now, but we're going to hand over to the Marine Conservation Society and they will teach you a little bit more about the bird colonies and everything that affects them and their lives. So you've just heard all about Marley's Tangled Tail and today we're going to be focusing all about seabirds. I absolutely love seabirds, I think they're fascinating and even when I was a very small girl they were one of the things that really grabbed my attention and made me so interested in looking after the creatures who live in our seas. Have you ever seen a puffin? I hope so and if you haven't already then I encourage you to go and try and see some next summer when they're back on their seabird colonies. So I've never met anyone who doesn't like puffins. They are just really lovely birds to watch and they're sometimes called the clowns of the sea because they are kind of funny as well when you watch them. Just like the leatherback turtle and like humpback whales, these animals are threatened. Puffins are vulnerable to global extinction. Remember what we talked about extinction? This means that the number of puffins in the world is going down and down so fast and so far that we're really worried that there might not be any puffins left. And that's why it's so important that we act now. We need to stop things like plastic from harming these incredible animals. So I would like to teach you more about puffins. And to do that, I'm going to take you on some exciting journeys. Seabirds breed in seabird colonies. So what does this mean? Well, it means that when they want to make a nest, they don't just go off on their own uh, with their partner and make a nest. They like to have lots of their pals around. And we're not talking just a few of them. We are talking thousands and thousands of puffins all living together in a colony, um, making their nests at the same time in the same place. The seabirds you can see in these photos are called guillemots. They're close relatives of the puffin. Why do you think they might do this? Any ideas? So this is about safety from predators. Safety in numbers. The more of you that there are, the more likely that you are going to be safe to defend your nest, protect your chick or your egg from predators. So I am lucky enough as a biologist to have worked in some amazing places and with some amazing animals. So a few years ago I was um, able to help out with some seabird research on puffins and to do that I went to this amazing place off, way off on the northwest of Scotland and that's where I'm going to take you now. And I want to show you exactly where those islands are. So firstly, here's Edinburgh, here's St Andrews and we're going all the way up here to an area of sea called the Minch, which is between Skye and the Outer Hebrides, and the islands are called the Shants. One of the exciting things about studying seabirds is that you get to go on boats to interesting places, and whilst you're on the way, you might see other things, like this lovely common seal, or remember the dolphins from the previous video? They're also on the way out to these islands. This is what the shants look like and when you're living there, there's a small bunkhouse or a tent to live in. So this is what a seabird colony looks like. It's noisy and it's kind of smelly as well. With that many seabirds around, that's a lot of seabird poo. And seabird colonies have a very particular smell. I absolutely love seabird colonies. They're amazing places. And just the opportunity to have such close contact with puffins, to see them walking around. Sometimes they'll even walk over your feet on their way to their nests. It's really amazing. Now, where do seabirds make their nests? Birds like puffins. So in the book, we learn that they go in burrows. So sometimes those burrows are like rabbit burrows into dirt. Um, or sometimes they're actually in holes uh, between rocks. And in the colony you can see in the video here, they are nestled in between the boulders in these, this huge, huge boulder field. Lots of holes for puffins to crawl into to, to, make, uh, to lay their eggs and make their nest. 
This little guy is incredibly cute. Uh, it's a baby puffin. And you are learning all about how to be seabird scientists, so we need to use the proper words again. Any idea what we call a baby puffin? It's a cute name. We call them pufflings. Okay, so I was lucky enough to be involved in some research where we were just looking at these pufflings at different stages while they were in the nest, taking them out very carefully so that we could do important measurements, things like weighing them, measuring their wings and their legs and that sort of thing, so that we can understand more about how puffins are doing um, in the face of all kinds of threats, whether it's food availability, maybe there's less of their favourite food, sand eels, or plastic pollution, or even climate change. This research is so important. Puffins only lay one egg, and so they have one chick. So really they put all of their effort into just that one baby. Any idea how long a puffin lives? Well, they can live for about 20 years, quite a long time for a bird. And if you want to see a puffin, you can only do it whilst they're on their breeding grounds at their breeding colony, places like these islands or the cliffs where you can find these colonies all together. Typically, you might be able to go and visit one of these colonies between March and August, and it will be very noisy. Like I've said, they'll be full of puffins. But at any other time of year, those colonies will be really quiet. There'll be no puffins around. So where do they go? So when puffins aren't breeding, when they haven't got an egg or a, a chick, a puffling to look after, they are back off out at sea, flying around for many, many months, hunting fish, and you don't really see them at all. So you tend to only see seabirds when they come into their seabird islands to lay their eggs. So I hope you enjoy taking this journey with me to the incredible seabird islands of the Shants. But you don't have to travel to the Shants to be able to see seabirds. In fact, you can see them in lots of places all around Scotland. So I really encourage you to get out next summer and hopefully see some incredible things like puffins. Now, you might have thought that the Shants felt like a long way away from home. But last place I'd like to take you to is an island far, far away from Scotland. A few years ago, I was working as a scientist, as a biologist, and I was invited on an expedition halfway around the world. And I would like to show you some of the incredible things I saw there, and also to explain to you why I care so much about plastic pollution. I'm going to use the globe again to show you where these islands are. Here we are in Scotland, of course, and we're going to travel all the way to here. So this halfway around the world in the South Pacific Ocean. If you're looking at the world from the direction you are right now, from out of space maybe, you can't really see much land at all. It's mostly ocean. The Pacific is huge, apart from a few small islands scattered across, and that's one of the places where I visited. So the islands are called Pitcairn, Pitcairn Islands, and the island particularly that I went to was called Henderson. Henderson doesn't normally have anybody living there, it's uninhabited. So when we were staying there, we were living in tents. So how long do you think a journey halfway around the world like this might take? Any ideas? Well, for me, this is the longest journey I've ever taken. It took almost one whole week. So we took three long haul flights. So that's really long flights where you're flying all through the night. And that took us to here somewhere in French Polynesia called the Marquesas. That's the closest we could get in an aeroplane. After that, we went on a boat, a boat that had been specially chartered just for us because not many boats go to this place. And it doesn't look like far on the globe between my two fingers there, but that actually took us two and a half days on the ocean. So it was really quite an incredible journey. This island is an incredible place. I felt very, very lucky to be there. You can see that it's beautiful and very tropical. There were interesting birds that I hadn't seen before, like this booby, and also these lorikeets and this pigeon that are found nowhere else on the planet. And we were there, in part, to study the seabirds. This cute little guy is a Murphy's petrel chick, so another type of seabird. These guys live on Henderson Island in large numbers, and we know that they're threatened for various reasons. So one of the things we were there to do was to understand more about where they travel to in the winter. 
To do this, we were using those small tracking devices. Remember I was talking about the ones that we used on turtles to understand where they travel to and where they go in the ocean? Exactly the same for seabirds, but smaller. Whilst we were living on this island, doing our scientific research, there were only five people. We were there for three months, living in tents, and in all the time we were there, we didn't see a single aeroplane. We saw one boat passing far away in the distance. We didn't have internet, we had no use for money, and so we really were about as far away from other people as it's possible to get. But unfortunately, we weren't far enough away from the impacts that we are having on our planet. You can probably imagine how sad I felt to witness this plastic pollution on such a remote island. The litter that you can see, it's arrived there from from the sea. It's floated in from absolutely every corner of the planet. And that includes us here in Scotland. Once litter goes into the sea, it can float around. It lasts for absolutely ever and it can arrive on amazing tropical paradise like this. And there's no one living on this island to clear up the litter. So unfortunately, we're seeing animals getting tangled up in it and killed by that litter. This is why I care so much about marine litter. We have got to stop it going into the oceans in the first place. Thank you so much for watching this far and for learning all about the incredible creatures who live in Scotland and elsewhere around the world and how the Marine Conservation Society are working hard to try and help those creatures. So we've learned about leatherback turtles, the biggest turtle in the world and how it visits us in Scotland, and how things like plastic bags can be mistaken for jellyfish, accidentally eaten and make them very, very poorly. But remember, there's ways in you can help. One of the things you can do is to take part in Jellyfish Watch. Tell us when you see jellyfish by putting it on our map. That will help us in some way to understand how to protect turtles better. You can also help by using less plastic. So that's things like trying not to use single-use plastic bags. Use a reusable bag. We also talked about other single-use plastic things that you might not need. Maybe it's straws or um, black plastic bottles and that sort of thing. We also talked, you remember, about whales and how we have some incredible cetaceans. So that's whales and dolphins living here in Scotland but how they're also threatened by plastic. We talked about Beach Watch. So this is our project where we are inviting you to clean the beach and also write down the sorts of litter that you find. Your safety is always the most important thing to us. So this year, beach cleans won't be as big as in the photo. It will probably just be you and your household, some of your family and a few friends, keeping it nice and small, but you can still have a big impact. Go to our website, the Great British Beach Clean, and you can find lots of information about how to make your beach clean as safe as possible. It would be fantastic if you could get involved in that. And today we learned about puffins and other seabirds. And I talked to you about how long plastic lasts once it's in the environment. So I really, really hope that you feel inspired to do your bit to try and help these incredible animals. So I also hope that after everything I've taught you, that you feel inspired to get out and go to the beach, go to the seaside when you get the chance with your family, and to learn a bit more about some of these amazing animals, because we are so lucky living here in Scotland to have some of these incredible, incredible creatures, whether they're puffins or leatherback turtles or whales or all kinds of other creatures that I haven't even had the chance to mention yet. So I hope you've enjoyed all of this. And I hope you'd like to visit our website to learn more about some of these amazing creatures. And if you've got any more questions, I would love to answer them. So just get in touch. This is our song, the song of the sea, the fire, the sun.